we're going to uh, have a little fun here and talk about uh, uh, some some parameters of, of spinal um, measurements. Where'd Udi go? Udi, what did you do with the participant list that was up here? Um, thank you. OK, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, um, some basic parameters of, of um, spinal balance. And then we're going to place those in the context of uh, of uh, management decisions, and then I'll finish up by showing um, our the evolution of our practice towards um, uh, uh, the inclusion of minimally invasive techniques for the management of of more and more complex spinal deformities. These are my disclosures. Uh, okay, as I explain to patients all the time in clinic, uh, we are supposed to live life with our head centered over our shoulders, centered over our pelvis centered over our feet. That has to be weighed against uh, uh, something that uh, Dr. Chapman already hinted at earlier, which is that life is a kyphosing event. We actually begin life um, with exaggerated kyphosis, and we end life with exaggerated kyphosis. I don't know if this is actually going to work. Um, and, uh, and so um, we have to be a little bit careful about um, how to apply the exact same parameters and, and thoughts to a 40-year-old as to uh, an 80-year-old. Is that a fair statement, Jens? 60-year-old. 60-year-old. All right. So um, who is Clint Morgan? Hello, Clint. What year are you? Where were you reared? <laughs> Oklahoma? And you're, and you're at the Barrow now? All right. What do you want to do with your life? Uh, Welcome. Welcome to the family, frankly. Um, do you recognize these, these, these terms at the bottom? Do you, uh, do you so what, it, what is SVA? Yeah. And what is the proper, what do we say is the, it, what, what's the proper parameters? What would be normal for SVA? Okay, and then uh, do you know what T1 tilt stands for? Yeah. It stands for T1 tilt, and um, <laughs> and so this was. I'm glad you said that because I was then going to follow that up by saying this is the one that is probably less, the least familiar of these four, um, and uh, but it's one that's gaining more prominence. Tyler, are you using T1 tilt in your practice? Not, not for the yeah. So we have a lot of people who are starting to swear more and more about by by T1 tilt, um, and your T1 tilt should be zero, basically. Okay. And then what's PT? Okay. And then what's the next one? Yeah. Pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis. Correct. Okay. So uh, pelvic tilt is a unique um, one of these things because pelvic tilt is variable, and we can all change our pelvic tilt. Um, uh, as we do all day, every day throughout throughout life. But pelvic tilt, our goal pelvic tilt is what? Less than 25 degrees or less than 20 is even better than less than 25. And then PILL is what? Yeah, mismatch plus or minus 10, and we'll talk a little bit about whether it should be within plus 10 or within minus 10 a little bit later. That was fantastic, Clint. You did a very nice very nice job. And it's lovely to see that these basic principles are uh, a much broader part of the educational um, program of resident training in neurological surgery. Our orthopedic colleagues would be proud of us as neurosurgeons that we think more about these, these things as, as time goes on. All right. So I tell my patients that you know the goal in life is to have your head centered over your shoulders, centered over your pelvis, centered over your feet. And then when we start talking about if we get through all the other non-surgical ma management options for scoliosis, which I won't talk about, but which actually represent the bulk of my practice, I, I operate on a paucity of people who come to see me for a diagnosis of scoliosis. Um, if we get through all of that and we get to the point that someone is in an appro appropriate adult uh, deformity patient for surgery, then we say the goal of surgery is to decompress neural elements or negate pen, pain generators, restore and or maintain spinal balance, and then obtain uh, an arthrodesis. So there are lots of ways to get there for um, when we have abnormal um, uh, sagittal uh, balance. 
And uh, you can think of it as on the right, you can extend the anterior column, or on the left, you can shorten the posterior column. And the Schwab osteotomy classification system has really been, um, for me, value add, because it just gives us a language and a construct to talk about things. And so we do this all the time back home in Pittsburgh, and we know what it is that we're about to get ourselves into if we're going to be doing a grade three or a grade four. Um, posterior spinal osteotomy, and everybody understands what that means. Um, so not only does it does it give us a construct for for doing research, um, but it also gives us a construct for the clinical communication of when it is that we want to do uh, posterior shortening interventions as opposed to anterior lengthening interventions. Um, anterior lengthening interventions are growing in our practice. Um, where when we can lengthen anteriorly, we find that we can achieve induction of, um, of our spinal parameters that we're looking for through less blood loss. Uh, so we have a lot, of, uh, a lot more anterior lengthening uh, operations being done now than, than in the past. But you can see, so on the left is a, is a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and on the right is um, an anterior column realignment in ACR with a hyperlordotic cage after sectioning of the ALL. So our, a pragmatic approach to sagittal alignment, because you can absolutely drown yourself in 4,000 measurements, not just three or four measurements. Uh, but a pragmatic approach is to measure the pelvic incidence and to do that first, because in the end, your, your, your spinal balance is dictated, and all the rest of it is dictated by the way your pelvis was constructed at birth. If you have a low pelvic incidence, it drives a whole host of other things compared to people who have a high pelvic incidence. And I'll give you a perfect example is that I often will see someone who's coming in with a pain syndrome in the setting of an idiopathic scoliotic curve. And in fact, so their real problem is PARS defects at L5 with an L5-S1 spondy, which is something I almost never see in someone with a low pelvic incidence. I almost exclusively see that clinical abnormality in someone with a high pelvic incidence, high sacral slope, sacrum pointing at the floor, where the, where the physical forces over time are much more likely to allow for the development of, um, uh, of a spondylolisthesis. So I begin my pragmatic approach to the concept of, of sagittal alignment by, by first measuring uh, the pelvic incidence, because then you can have an understanding of the harmony of the spinal curves in relation to the pelvic incidence, and then you can look for mechanisms by which people are compensating for um, a lack of harmony uh, in their, in their um, sagittal balance. So as I said, pelvic incidence is the uh, fixed parameter at birth of the orientation of the sacrum inside of the pelvis. Some people have a low pelvic incidence. Some people have a mid-range pelvic incidence. Some people have a high-range pelvic incidence. Your pelvic incidence drives so many other things about your um, spine, and this is a fixed variable. So you cannot change your pelvic incidence um, yourself. So if you have a midpoint um, pelvic incidence of around 50 degrees um, versus a low pelvic incidence closer to 30 degrees or a high pelvic incidence, which would be a pelvic incidence in the 70s or, or 80, it, it changes some things. So the low pelvic incidence person has a flat sacrum, and we all see this as we walk the earth. You notice people who have, who have really flat butts and really have a flat sacrum that's someone who has a low pelvic incidence. And then you see people, you know, like, uh, like uh, achondroplastic dwarfs has very high pelvic incidences and they have those bubble butts sticking back that's driven by their pelvic incidence. It, it just is. And so you can, you, you can I, I look at the world differently now. It's like, walk through the airport. And I'm like thinking to myself, like, well, you're gonna be impossible to correct. But uh, uh, anyway, I digress. <laughs> the goal is to have a relationship between your lumbar lordosis and your pelvic incidence. So in the old days when we would say, well, what's a normal lumbar lordosis? It's an impoverished concept, right? Because as Clint pointed out, your lumbar lordosis should be plus or minus 10 degrees from your pelvic incidence. And so normal lumbar lordosis isn't necessarily 40 or 50 degrees. Normal lumbar lordosis for you as an individual is in the context of whether you have a low, middle, or high pelvic incidence. Another thing that drives 
um, downstream from your pelvic incidence is where the apex of your lumbar lordosis is. And we classically say that half of lumbar lordosis, or maybe even a little bit more than half of lumbar lordosis, is between L4 and S1, which is a true statement and does have a lot to do with our thought process of what it is we're gonna do for a patient with a spinal deformity who also needs a sagittal plane correction. But you should bear in mind that as your pelvic incidence rises, the larger your pelvic incidence, the higher the apex of your lumbar lordosis is. And we see this have implications for proximal junctional failure. That if you are doing uh, disharmonious corrections, then you are actually increasing the risk of proximal junctional failure. You want your harmony to also be reflective of where the apex of your lumbar lordosis should be, which is driven by the first point in the pragmatic approach to spinal parameters, which is to understand what someone's pelvic incidence is, okay? Then the last thing that I said was identifying compensatory mechanisms. And this can be done um, by uh, physically observing the patients. So I always have these people stand up in clinic. I always ask people to stand up. And I usually say, you know, point to where your pain is and, you know, it kind of engages them in the conversation. But what I'm really doing when I'm asking them to stand up and point to where their pain is, is I am, I am observing how it is that they achieve their own posture. And you see that knee flexion and you see other, you see people um, inducing a pelvic tilt to get their shoulders back that you can observe as you ask them to stand and do and do something else um, that can give you further in um, uh, insight and I think that uh, that this is also something that this this new generation of EOS imaging has taught us because if you just have a a long cassette X-ray that stops just below the femoral heads you can lose the, um, uh, the observation of people who look like they have a good sagittal balance, who have the proper SVA of four centimeters or less, but they're achieving that by flexing their knees and retroverting their pelvis. So Tyler, how has the EOS, I think you have a microphone, how has EOS changed your practice? Yeah, the EOS is fantastic. It, um it shows you just what you see up there where you can see the compensation used to early on I, when I was doing my fellow year, I would routinely have to go down to x-ray and get somebody stand up differently. We'd go down, oh, they weren't standing up well, go down and observe them, make sure their knees weren't bent and things. Now you can actually just measure it and look at it and factor it in. Um, it's faster than a regular x-ray. It gives you a longer view. It's, it's, it's great technology. How many people, are, do, you have a, do you have an EOS, Isaac? Yeah, we don't have one yet either. What about you, Jim? Technically, it's send people over there. Yeah. Um, and then we have one at our children's hospital, but not our adult hospital. And when I really, really, really want it, I can send some over to, someone over to children's. But I, I, I'm just really looking forward to the day that, that we have it. All right, the sagittal plane deformity is a bigger driver of pain and disability than the coronal plane deformity in people with scoliosis. And these are the things we're most focused on, the PIL match or mismatch, the SVA, the pelvic tilt is the most common compensatory mechanism that we measure because most of us don't have EOS and don't measure the knee flexion compensatory mechanism. We want that PIL mismatch to be within 10 degrees. We want the SVA uh, to be four centimeters or less. We want their pelvic tilt under 25. Uh, under 25 degrees, and we know that as you incrementally get away from those target parameters, then as a population in the adult deformity world, the, the pain and disability goes higher and higher. So the more, the more um, unbalanced you are, the more miserable you are, and that's, that's ISSG data. Interestingly, interestingly though, this has implications outside of the deformity world. And this was a great um, data set that Zach Temple put together. This has also been shown by our colleagues in Europe, that if you just take a one level t lift, and if your PILL mismatch is, is mismatched, after a one level t lift, you have a vastly higher rate of adjacent segment degeneration and the need for adjacent segment surgery. And what was remarkable is that when we looked at our own practice, 75% of patients who had a PILL mismatch greater than 11 degrees after a one level T-lift ended up needing a revision operation. 
that, that's pretty remarkable. Now, and for each degree increase, it, it, uh, the odds of developing adjacent level <laughs> disease increase by 1.4 fold. So we have to be very careful before Jim chimes in about this. I am not suggesting that you take every four or five spondy and turn it into a deformity procedure. I'm just telling you that, that this is what we've observed. And I'm not suggesting that an L4-5 spondy should now be treated by a pedicle subtraction osteotomy at L3 and a T10 to pelvis, which is a fabulous way to fail the boards, by the way. And one of the most common ways to fail the boards over the last three or four years has been the, 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 the ABNS reviewing the cases of people sitting for the boards and seeing T10 to the pelvis being done for a ridiculous indication and saying, guess what, you get to come back next year. Jim. No, I'm just going to comment. You actually answered my question and you said, I love that, that paper. You also didn't say that the people with, the, with less than 11 degrees had 80% vision rate for But the. <laughs> 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 but the <laughs> and I totally agree with you. I just struggle with that. I have a couple of these pigs, I just have this body, and I put on my way up this body. And I knew that, but to take someone from, I'm going to do a key lift. Big jump, big jump. Um, but for me, what what this recognition has done is it it's helped me um, communicate to patients that you know, look, uh, uh, spine disease is frequently not a one-off problem. And, and if, you're, if you're 46 years old and you're having a spine operation, the likelihood of you're having another spine operation in your lifetime is very high. And those are the sorts of things that I, that I counsel people about as we're going through, as opposed to saying, you have a four or five spondy, so I'm gonna do occiput to the pelvis. Um, uh, okay, so we talked about these alignment targets. Then I'm just gonna shift and say, okay, we know what we wanna achieve, can we achieve these goals with minimally invasive strategies? And, uh, and the answer to that question is yes. And actually for us, the answer to that question being yes is growing to a larger and larger percentage of our practice. And for us in 2016, that was an inflection point because 2016 is when we really started to embrace the ACR into the practice. And when I say we, I mean um, Adam Cantor and I, because we do so many of these cases together. And our, our, our MIS scoliosis practice, we, we is together. We do, the, we do those cases together. So 2016 represented an inflection point in our practice because of the introduction, inclusion, and embracing of anterior column realignment um, into the practice. The other thing that I'll say about this before I talk, start talking about MIS scoliosis surgery is that this still represents overall a very small percentage of what it is that I do. And if you actually rank order what it is that I do from least, from most frequent to least frequent, the most frequent thing that I do is nothing. The most common intervention for someone with an adult deformity who comes to see me in clinic is nothing. We, we focus on physical therapy, weight loss, bone density management, and a whole host of other things. So the number one thing that we do is nothing, no surgery. The second most common thing that we do is actually a foraminal decompression for radicular pain. In a 74-year-old lady who has a double major curve and she's got 64 degrees of thoracolumbar scoliosis, but her problem is an L3 radiculopathy at the level of the elastesis, okay? That is not a T2 to pelvis intervention. That is an MIS foraminotomy to relieve her L3 radicular symptom on one side. That's the second most common intervention that we do in the world of adult spinal deformity. And then you get, then you get down to you know, the giant um, corrections eventually. And for us now, MIS procedures are one option inside of our armamentarium. Have you looked at the incidences scoliosis progression in those patients? Yes, so I follow people for at least one year. If we do a foraminotomy and I say to them ahead of time that the challenge in this operation is for me to relieve the pressure on your nerve and not substitute one problem for another by weakening your spine through the decompression such that your scoliosis gets worse. And we follow those people for a year and it's actually a very small conversion 
from uh, from foraminotomy to something bigger. Yeah, which is separate from people who have severe pain syndromes that aren't related to a single nerve root being compressed. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so how did we get to this point that we can do MIS scoliosis surgery? Well, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And uh, I credit Jurgen Harms, and Bo Jameson is here from, from Depew, and I had the great fortune of doing what Chaffrey used to call his pilgrimage to go watch Jurgen Harms operate. And uh, Bo Jameson was, uh, was our, our um, travel liaison back in those days. And, uh, and I still have, you know, we still have a lot of laughs and great, great memories of the group of people that we were together with on that, on that trip. And I'll never forget, we were, Chris and I were watching Jurgen Harms do this transoral C2 corpectomy insertion of a Harms cage. And then he, he, he put, he anchored the cage through the C1 lateral mass anteriorly. Um, it was crazy. And, uh, and, I, and Chris and I were standing next to each other and I was talking to him. I said, Chris, you know, I've been out for five years now. How are things going? He said, I'm doing things so completely differently from when you were a resident. And, uh, and he said, I am so much better now than I was five years ago. And that night, we're out to dinner with Jurgen Harms, 73 years old at the time. And uh, it's in November. And so the thing to do in, in, in Germany, in that part of Germany that time of year, is you eat fowl at dinner, duck, primarily. And then you, com you combine it with a Grau Berenger, a gray burgundy, Charlie. It's freaking spectacular. And, we're, and we're, we're, we're enjoying a great glass of Grau Beringer that night. And I say to Jurgen Harms, and I say, sir, how do you feel now compared to five years ago? And 73-year-old Professor Harms says to me, I am so much better now than I was five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, I really credit him with, um, and, and Chris Shaffrey to a lesser extent, but Chris, you know, has different problems. And, but really, Jurgen Harms with, uh, with helping us understand, even to this day, the value of the anterior approach for scoliosis. And in young people, in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, this is a remarkably effective procedure. Is yes. Is who? Yeah. yeah. So, you like that piece? Tell them what happened. Because this is my favorite story in the world. No, no, you got no. At what? At what? Are you asking for the recording to stop momentarily? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Arab. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I'll, I'll just interview Udi. What did you call him? So uh, let's go back to Udi's talk. <laughs> Udi talked about myeloma, right? And what was the summary of Udi's talk? Don't operate on myeloma. So Dave and Chris, while they were together in a small motel, ignoring the case, Harms was operating and did a C2 corpectomy for myeloma. And so, huh? Okay, by the way, you're not allowed to talk after I watch that freaking <laughs> operation on the freaking thing. And by next year, you have to next year you have to come early so you can listen am, to all the talks not, because you not, violated every rule in the world. About, I'm not talking about the indications for surgery. All I'm so, saying is that what we actually witnessed that day. No, no, I'm just saying was so Udi call, You haven't even gotten to the point. <laughs> the world premier number one spine surgeon in the world. And Udi, what did you call him? Did, did it be, I thought you called him a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and technically, you didn't call him a criminal. He said that is a crime. <laughs> I can't believe you don't remember that. <laughs> That's well, when I said, that guy is my hero. He's still alive, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He watches this video, he's going to come after Udi. Absolute. <laughs> he's he's watching. Rod, Rod loves him. He ligates C2 roots just because uh, uh, Jürgen Harms did it. So don't yes. eat that root. Absolute master. Uh, it, one of the great privileges of my life to have, have spent a few, a few days with him. Um, 
Then Larry Lanky taught us that uh, you can do absolutely everything through an open posterior approach. And you know, Larry likes to say that I haven't done an anterior approach in this millennium, basically. So he, like Tyler Kosky, although Tyler is embraced a little bit more than just than just the, uh, but you know, strong adherence to the open posterior approach. It's incredibly predictable. This is without a doubt. Larry Lanky's viewpoints on the management of adult deformity form the absolute modern, the, the absolute mainstay of my practice. This is the vast majority of what it is that I do, even though we are very interested in pursuing all of these other things. From a, from a percentage basis, this is still the, the basis of how it is that we manage um, uh, adult spinal deformity is, uh, is adhering to the things that, that Dr. Lanky has taught us about um, uh, open posterior approaches. So then came uh, the Brazilian wonderkin, uh, Luis Pimenta and his trans-psoas approach, which changed spine surgery on a, on a long list of levels, less morbid, um, other advantages. You can, you can take advantage of technology and all kinds of different uh, asymmetric cages, hyperlordotic cages, all these other sorts of things uh, to leverage the lateral approach to achieve your goals. And in my opinion, the lateral approach is the modern anterior approach. But that's not enough. And I, I credit Reg Hayde with, with, uh, with reinvigorating um, the, uh, the anterior approach, which has always been um, uh, a, a foundation of orthopedic spine care. I mean, our orthopedic colleagues never went, went away from the A-LIF. It took neurosurgeons a lot longer to understand the value um, of, uh, of the A-LIF. But the A-LIF did have a bit of a waxing and waning prevalence in the, um, over time. But the A-LIF is back, and it's back in a very big way. And now again, with new technology, hyperlordotic cages, and other things, um, we can uh, we can apply an old operation to our current um, interventions and really create value add. And then I think that uh, between um, Beirut and Greg Mundus and um, and Eslack and Uribe and others, the the ACR um, has also started to proliferate. I think you have to be very careful and you have to really know what you're doing if you're going to do this um, approach and genuinely resect or uh, transect the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament. Um, but the, uh, the ACR um, is, is, is a big, big reason why we can do more things with an all MIS approach. And again, you know, if you compare the blood loss from a pedicle subtraction osteotomy to an ACR, uh, it's a tiny fraction. So it dramatically expands the indications for MRI scoliosis surgery. And I think that Neil Anand um, really was, in many ways, not just the, the early or earliest adopter, but really the person who started to frame data surrounding MIS interventions for scoliosis surgery. So I give a lot of credit to Neil Anand. Um, for me, it's been exciting to walk this journey with, uh, with, with Adam Cantor um, and, uh, and the application and the concept that if you can combine a couple different MIS approaches, then you can achieve the same goals potentially with less morbidity than, uh, than an open traditional posterior approach. So uh, for me, this is the marriage of spinal principles and, sp and medical technology to advance spine care. And I'll show this and finish this up with an example. 59-year-old lady, severe unrelenting back pain, fails prolonged, protracted attempts at non-surgical management. You can see that she is not in a good place. So Clint, what do you think about those parameters? Pretty dramatically off. Correct. So how would this be? Yeah. Tyler, what would be your thought process of the, of the, of the intervention for this poor woman? Anytime it's, I mean, I would be open, that'd be a pretty standard take that and help the feet at the bottom like all one day, uh, which is a pretty common. What is sad to be a balance like that and going all the way down, that's, that's the best approach. Isaac? Yeah, same. T lifts four, five, and five, one. Nugent? Um, I, I, I would do T lifts on the five, one. I like the lateral approach. I think I could really free up the angles on either side. So for me, it's a multi level lateral, a stage one. 
And then stage two is the post zero to 10 fatalities for the TLF file. Okay. Um, that is pretty much how we've handled things from 2010 to 2016 and even into 2019. Um, but in this particular instance, we, we went for an L34ACR, L23, L45 LLIFs, L5S1 ALIF ACR, and then T11 iliac posterior instrument infusion. And uh, so we talked about this already that you know now we have all these great additional tools through MIS approaches to go after this. So here she is after the first day, and we stage this. So day one, she gets uh, two LLIFs, an LLIF ACR, an, uh, an ALIF ACR, and you can already see that we have, look, I mean, look at the impact on her sagittal balance. It's, it's really quite dramatic. And so there's, there's been an impact on her coronal plane deformity, but her sagittal plane is really the thing that says to me, this x-ray here, which I intentionally stage these things, so I see that her standing x-ray between the stages, I have achieved the induction of sagittal plane correction that I need in order for her to have spinal balance. And so now, to me, this is something that I can finish this off with an, with an MIS posterior approach. If I don't have this x-ray telling me that we have achieved the goals, then, um, and the patients are counseled on this ahead of time, I have to do the, the last stage of this through uh, an open posterior approach with additional osteotomies. And then we have all these great technologies that, so I have an intraoperative CT scanner, navigation, we do this with powered, um, uh, powered navigated, so I use, there's no K-wires actually, there's no radiation, no K-wires. So the patient's positioned, we get a CAT scan on the table, we're all out of the room, we come back in, and I use the spine mask, um, auto registration to the navigation system. I have a navigated all tap, so I can make a stab incision and navigate the all tap down, no K wire, come right back out, pop the screw in. Um, and, uh, and then we have this computerized uh, rod bending um, option, and I think I just ran out of battery, which is weird. Which is fantastic, but I can tell you that her last um, her last uh, uh, X-ray shows that we achieved the goals of surgery through an all MIS approach. Thank you. That was great.